Chapter Fourteen of Kabumpo in Oz. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Fourteen. Terror in Ozma's Palace. Meanwhile. Strange things had been happening in Ozma's palace. For the people inside, it had been a very mean time indeed. During Ruggedo's run to the mountains of Ev, they had almost been shaken out of their wits, and when he sat down upon the mountain top, there was not a person nor piece of furniture standing in the whole palace. Courtiers and servants who were not knocked senseless lay shaking in their beds or huddled in corners and under sofas and chairs, just as they had fallen when the first terrible crash lifted the palace into the air. Ozma's four-poster bed had collapsed, pinning the little fairy princess under a mass of silk hangings and curtain poles. Being a fairy, Ozma was unhurt, but not being able to move, nor to reach her magic belt, or even make herself heard, she was forced to lie perfectly still and wait for help. In Dorothy's sitting-room there was not a sound but the ticking of the copper man's machinery. Trot and Betsy Bobbin had knocked their heads together so smartly that they were unconscious. Sir Hocus had been hurled violently against Tick-Tock, and the poor knight had known nothing since. Dorothy lay quietly beside him, an ugly bruise on her forehead where the emerald clock had landed. "'Scraps!' called the scarecrow, some time after the rumble and tumble had ceased. "'Are you there?' "'No, here,' gasped the patchwork girl, sitting up cautiously. She had bounced all around the room, and finally rolled into a corner quite close to the scarecrow himself. She put out her cotton hand as she spoke and touched him. "'How fortunate we are unbreakable,' said the scarecrow, pressing her cotton fingers convulsively, and trying to peer out through the intense blackness of the room. "'What happened?' "'Earthquake,' shivered Scraps, "'and maybe it's not over.' "'Must have knocked everybody silly,' said the scarecrow huskily. "'Except us,' giggled the patchwork girl. "'We couldn't be knock silly, "'cause we were silly in the first place.' "'Now don't make jokes, please,' begged the scarecrow. "'This is serious. "'Besides, I want to think.' "'All right,' said Scraps cheerfully. "'I don't, but I'm going to feel around "'and see if I can find the matches. "'There used to be some candles on the mantel, "'and,' as she spoke, Scraps fell headlong over Sir Hocus of Pokes, and as luck would have it, her cotton fingers closed over a small gold matchbox. Picking herself up carefully, Scraps struck a match on Sir Hocus's armor and looked anxiously around the room. They need water, said the patchwork girl, wrinkling up her patchwork forehead. "'So will you if you don't blow out that match?' cried the scarecrow in alarm, for Scraps continued to hold the match till it burned to the very end. He jumped up clumsily and puffed out the light just in time. Scraps promptly lit another, and as she did so, the scarecrow saw a tall blue candle sticking out of the waste-basket. "'Here,' said the straw man nervously, "'light this, and stand it on the mantel there.' By the flickering candlelight the scarecrow and Scraps tried to set Dorothy's room to rights. They dragged the mattress from the bedroom and placed the little girls on it side by side. Sir Hocus was too heavy to move, so they merely loosened his armor and put a sofa cushion under his head. Then, just as Scraps was going for some water, the room began to tremble again. "'I told you it wasn't over,' cried Scraps, flinging both arms about the scarecrow's neck and as they rocked to and fro she shouted merrily, "'Shaker, shaker, who art thee, to shake a castle like a tree? Shaker, shaker, go away, and come again some other day.' "'Now, Scraps,' begged the scarecrow, steadying the patchwork girl with one hand, and catching hold of a table with the other, "'everything depends on us. Do try to keep your head.' "'Keep my head?' 
shrilled Scraps as the room tilted over and slid all the furniture sideways. I'll be lucky if I keep my feet. Whoopee, here we go. And go they did with a rush into the farthest corner. Slowly the room righted itself and everything grew quiet again. I know what I'm going to do, said the Scarecrow determinedly. Before anything else happens, I'm going to see what has happened already. How? asked Scraps, bouncing to her feet. The magic picture, gasped the Scarecrow. You bring the candle, Scraps, like a good girl. You're less liable to take fire than I am. Then we'll come back and help Dorothy and the others. Good idea, said Scraps, taking the candle from the mantel. Breathlessly, the two tiptoed along the hall to Ozma's apartment. On the wall, in one of Ozma's rooms, hangs the most magic possession in Oz. It is a picture representing a country scene. But when you ask it where a certain person is, immediately he is shown in the picture, and also what he is doing at the time. So, murmured the scarecrow as they gained the room in safety, if it tells where other people are, it ought to tell us where we are ourselves. Drawing aside the curtain that covered the picture, the scarecrow demanded loudly, Where are we? Scraps held the candle so that its flickering rays fell directly on the picture. Then both jumped in earnest, for in a flash the face of Ruggedo, the wicked old gnome king, appeared, on his head a great green towering sort of hat. The scarecrow seized the candle from Scraps and held it closer to the picture. He squinted up one eye and almost rubbed his painted nose off. "'Great kinkajous!' spluttered the straw man distractedly. "'That's a palace on his head! An emerald palace! Ozma's palace!' "'But how?' asked Scraps, her suspender button eyes almost dropping out. "'He's nothing but a gnome. He's—' Before Scraps could finish her sentence, the palace began to tilt forward, and they both fell upon their faces. Then the picture jerked loose and fell with a clattering slam on their heads, followed by such ornaments as had not already tumbled down before. Through it all, Scraps held the candle high in air, and fortunately it did not go out, despite the turmoil. In a few moments the palace stopped rocking, and a muffled call from Ozma sent the scarecrow and Scraps hurrying to her bedside. After some trouble, for they were both flimsily made, they managed to free the little princess of Oz from the poles and bed curtains. Goodness, sighed Ozma, looking around at the terrible confusion. Not goodness, but badness, said the scarecrow, settling his hat firmly. And Ruggedo is at the bottom of it and of us. He quickly explained to Ozma what he had seen in the magic picture. Slipping on a silk robe, Ozma followed them into the next room. When the picture had been rehung, they all looked again. This time Ozma asked where the palace was. Immediately the old gnome king appeared, and there could be no mistake. The palace was set squarely on his head. The picture did not show the real size of Ruggedo, nor of the palace, but it was enough. He must have sprung into a giant, gasped Ozma scarcely believing her eyes. Oh, what shall we do? The first thing to do is to keep him quiet. Every time he shakes his head, it tumbles us about so, complained the scarecrow, plumping up straw in his chest. And we must look after Dorothy and Betsy and Trot. And Sir Hocus, added the patchwork girl, flinging out one hand. He's yearning to slay a giant. Way for the giant killer! Without waiting for the others, Scraps ran back to Dorothy's sitting-room. Lighting another candle, for all the lights in the palace were out, Ozma and the Scarecrow followed. "'Odds goblins!' gasped the knight as they entered. He was sitting up with one hand on his head. "'Not goblins, giants!' cried the patchwork girl, with the bounce, while Ozma ran for some water to restore her three little friends. "'Where?' puffed the knight, lurching to his feet. "'Beneath you,' said the scarecrow, clutching at a wisp of straw that stuck out of his head. "'Say, someone wind up tick-tock. There's a lot of thinking to be done here, and his head works very well, even if it has wheels inside.' Sir Hocus, though still a bit dizzy, hastened to wind up all the copper man's keys. 
Thanks, said Tick-Tock immediately. Give me a lift up, Hocus. The knight obligingly helped the copper man to his feet. Then both stared in amazement at the topsy-turvy room. Even in the dim candlelight they could see that something very serious had occurred. Jack Pumpkinhead picked himself up out of a corner, looking very much dazed. Just then Dorothy opened her eyes, and Betsy and Trot, spluttering from the water the patchwork girl was pouring on their heads, sat up and wanted to know what had happened. In a few words Ozma told them what the magic picture had revealed. Ruggedo to a giant's groan, and set us on his head. We've made some headway, you'll admit, since we have gone to bed, shouted Scraps, who was growing more and more excited. Ruggedo will never reform, ticked the copper man sadly. But what are we going to do, wailed Dorothy? Suppose he leans over and spills us all out. I shall take my sword, said Sir Hocus, speaking very determinedly, and backing toward the window as he spoke. Climb down and slay the villain. He threw one leg over the sill. Come back, cried Ozma. Dear Sir Hocus, don't you realize that if you kill Ruggedo, he will fall down and break us to pieces? Besides, wicked as he is, I could not have him killed. Yes, we should be all broken up if you did that, sighed the Scarecrow. We must try something else. Reluctantly, the knight dropped back into the room. Close the windows, ordered Ozma with a little shudder. I've thought of a plan, said Tick-Tock in his slow, painstaking way. A very good plan. Tell us what it is, begged Dorothy, and oh, Tick-Tock, hurry. Eggs, said the copper man solemnly. Oh, gasped Dorothy, I remember. Eggs are the only things in Oz that Ruggedo is afraid of, for if an egg touches a gnome, he shrivels up and disappears. Then where are the eggs? demanded Sir Hocus gloomily. In faith, this sounds more like an omelet than a battle, but if we're to fight with eggs instead of swords, let us draw them at once. You mean throw them, corrected Dorothy but Tick-Tock shook his head violently. Not throw them, said the copper man slowly. Threaten to throw them. But how can we threaten a giant so far below us? asked Ozma. Print a sign, directed Tick-Tock calmly, and lower it down to him. Tick-Tock, cried the scarecrow, rushing forward and embracing him impulsively. "'Your patent action double-guaranteed brains are marvels. "'I couldn't have thought up a better plan myself. "'Now off ran Scraps to fetch a huge piece of cardboard "'and the scarecrow for a paintbrush "'and Sir Hocus for a piece of rope. "'It's growing lighter,' quavered Trot, "'looking toward the windows. "'The sky was turning gray with little streaks of pink, "'and the three girls huddled together on the mattress gave a sigh of relief, for nothing, not even a giant, seems so bad by daylight. Perhaps someone has already started to help us, said Ozma hopefully. But here's the signboard. What shall we write? How shall I begin? asked the scarecrow, dipping the brush into a can of green paint. Dear Ruggedo? I should say not, said Dorothy indignantly. Then I shall simply say, Sir, said the scarecrow. If you move, or turn, or shake your head again, ten thousand eggs will be hurled from the palace windows, suggested Tick-Tock. As this message met with general approval, the scarecrow set it down with many flourishes and blotches of paint spilled between. Then Ozma painted her name and the royal seal of Oz at the end. Meanwhile, with the help of a pair of field glasses, Sir Hocus had located Ruggedo's nose, sticking out like a huge cliff below the middle window of Dorothy's room. So, tying a long rope to each corner of the sign, and rolling it up so it would go through the window, the knight let it down till it dangled directly in front of Ruggedo's nose. At first Ruggedo did not even see the sign, which was about as large as the tiniest visiting card compared to him. 
but it blew against his face and tickled his cheek. He tried to brush it away, then suddenly noticing it was dangling from above, he seized it in one hand and held it close to his left eye. The words were so small for a giant that Ruggedo had to squint fearfully before he could make them out at all. But when he did he gave a blood-curdling scream and began to tremble violently. Up in the palace the entire company fell over, and twenty windows were shaken to bits. Then everything grew quiet, and there was perfect silence. For Ruggedo, realizing his danger, grew rigid with fright. Giant drops of perspiration trickled down his forehead. How long could he keep from moving? Well, said Dorothy, after a few minutes had passed, I guess that will keep him quiet. But what next? Shall we let ourselves down with ropes? We have none long enough, said Sir Hokus. Then I'll fall out and go for help, said the Scarecrow brightly, and started toward the window. When he reached it, he paused in astonishment. Look, he cried, waving excitedly to the others. Here comes someone, walking right over the clouds. End of chapter 14 Recording by Pam Castile